Good morning. Um, we're going to make a start. Uh, my name's uh, Michael Brady. My pronouns are he and him. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to this, the launch of uh, the If We're Not Counted, We Don't Count uh, new best practice guidance uh, on sexual orientation, gender identity and trans status uh, monitoring. Um, a few bits of housekeeping, um, or just to let you know how the session is going to run. Uh, we have some great speakers. Um, <coughs> shortly um, who are going to uh, give some brief talks on the topic um, and uh, then we're going to have some time uh, towards the end of the session for Q&A so I would encourage you if you have any questions to uh, put those in the Q&A uh, box and we'll collate those and discuss them as a panel uh, at the or towards the end of the meeting. Um, the session uh, is being recorded um, but just to reassure you, only the panelists are being recorded. None of the attendees uh, data or information or names or email addresses or questions uh, is being uh, collected. Um, the recording will be made available after the session and is going to be embedded on the website where the resource uh, lives on the LGBT Foundation uh, website and we'll be sharing a link for that uh, later on. We're also going to collect um, the questions together and pull together an FAQ with the questions that come through the session and also we'll add to that other commonly asked questions uh, that I'm sure we all get all the time on this topic uh, and uh, hopefully that'll be a, uh, a resource that will support uh, the use of the uh, good practice uh, guidance and we'll be circulating that uh, to attendees after uh, the meeting. Um, before we get into the main uh, bulk of the meeting, I have a few thanks to add, lest I forget towards uh, the end. A huge thank you needs to go to everybody at the LGBT Foundation who have worked so hard, uh, not just on publishing, uh, pulling together, uh, developing uh, and publishing this specific document, but as you'll hear shortly from Paul Martin, have been working very hard over many years and have the scars to prove it uh, in pushing this agenda. This is such an important agenda around improving uh, monitoring and the use of data on sexual orientation, gender identity and trans status. So thank you to everyone in the LGBT Foundation for this work specifically, but also uh, for your ongoing work in this area. I also need to thank uh, my colleagues, uh, Lizzie Streeter and Tash Oaks Munger, who work with me um, tirelessly at NHS uh, England um, to, uh, to move this area forward. I've forgotten even if, I, if I've introduced myself, did I? I can't remember. Um, I'm Michael Brady, pronouns he, him. I'm the National Advisor for LGBT uh, Health. Okay, so we're, going to um, crack on and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, someone who probably knows more about this area than than most who's going to start us off with a bit of background and history to this work so it's a great pleasure to welcome Paul Martin who's the chief executive of the LGBT Foundation. Thank you Michael and also I just want to add into my thanks before I start your leadership in this area for keeping the dream alive and working through the um, multiple uh, kind of like stresses and strains of the system in order to kind of like get sexual orientation monitoring and indeed trans status monitoring uh, uh, front and centre. So thank you very much, Michael, and uh, to your team as well. So good morning, everybody. My name is Paul Martin. I'm the chief exec of LGBT uh, Foundation and my pronouns are he and him. And uh, a very, very small uh, introduction to LGBT Foundation, just in case you've not heard of us. Our work started in 1975 and we've been changing the lives of LGBT people ever since. Over the last five decades, we provided the widest range of services and support to the largest number of LGBT people than any other organization of our kind in the UK. We've also been at the forefront of social and legal justice for change. And that means that more LGBT people have more rights and more protections than ever before. Based in Manchester, we are a national charity and every year we serve over 40,000 people and our work is as urgent now as it's ever been. Through our services and support, we reduce isolation, help people feel more confident and enable them to flourish. And we work in partnership, no more so uh, than today, uh, to build strong, cohesive and influential communities. And we're working towards securing a safe, healthy and equal future for all LGBT people and our 
our allies. So the presentation or the little um, introduction I'm going to give uh, this morning uh, takes us back to 2012, although actually I can uh, uh, find references to working on uh, sexual orientation monitoring uh, back to 2008, uh, trying to work with the Department of Health, uh, as it was called then, to sort of like get monitoring uh, 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 included in the agenda. But um, the particular work that we're focusing on and the introduction of a fundamental uh, information standard started in 2012. And that was particularly with the development of uh, NHS England and also the development of what was then called the Health and Wellbeing Alliance, which saw the introduction of the National LGBT uh, Partnership, of which I'm chair. And the National LGBT Partnership back in 2012 decided that monitoring should be a golden thread of all of our work and it should actually um, be the primary focus of all of the interventions that we undertook. Now we wanted to see um, monitoring of both sexual orientation and trans status, although actually it's not until much more recently that we've seen um, trans status monitoring and Michelle um, is going to talk a little bit more about that uh, later on uh, this morning. So we created back in 2012 a time limited task and finish group. I thought optimistically six to 12 months, and it actually took seven years of very, very hard and quite intensive work at times of a multi-agency group of people, um, including the Royal College of Nursing, the BMA, NHS Employers, Health, uh, HEE, um, as well as Government Equalities Office, um, and indeed representatives from PHE, Department of Health, and indeed NHS England, and uh, a number of voluntary organisations led by the National LGBT. Uh, partnership. And we worked tirelessly, really, in terms of trying to um, get the system and the health and social care system to sort of like take monitoring seriously. And we had an enormous range of um, challenges, an enormous range of obstacles put in our way. And I think that's probably still true, although the general LGBT public are in the main very, very comfortable in disclosing their sexual orientation and their trans status, if they uh, see that the conditions are safe to do so, actually it's often people um, working in the system that are the most resistant to it. And we have faced a whole range of different challenges and obstacles over uh, the last years. But we have nevertheless clearly focused on introducing um, the standard. And back in 2017, on the 5th of October, finally the system saw the introduction of um, uh, uh, an information standard for sexual orientation. It's a fundamental standard, which means that it's not mandatory. Um, and the standard itself, uh, as the introduction to uh, our guide says, it provides the mechanism um, for recording the sexual orientation of all patients and service users over 16 years of age across all health services and with within local authorities have responsibilities for adult social care across England. And many people don't necessarily see that this standard actually affects uh, social care in the same way that it does um, health services. We produced um, the guidance to uh, the standard, which this today we're producing a, an update. But we also, uh, back in 2017, put in place a whole range of different mechanisms to ensure that the system and most importantly colleagues across health and social care had the tools in which to kind of like introduce and implement uh, the standard and that included things like regional engagement events, learning sessions, um, uh, 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 e-learning modules and so on and so forth. It's true to say that the standard wasn't universally welcome. Joe, if you could just share the slide for me please. So this just gives you a little snapshot of some of the uh, responses that we received um, back in October 2017. And you'll also see that we didn't get an easy ride from the LGBT press either. It seemed that everyone and her wife, uh, all the world and her wife was actually a critic. And I spent a very surreal 36 hours where I was cocooned um, in a media bubble. And I seemed to be the only person in the whole country that was trying to positively uh, uh, represent the uh, sexual orientation monitoring information standard. And unfortunately, 
we didn't get any support from ministers or senior uh, health or civil servants. And I think the same is true today, actually. We've still yet to see sort of like professional bodies come out um, and universally kind of like support um, this uh, standard. But what's really, really important to recognise here is that in actual fact, everybody, um, apart from the new statesman, really, and possibly the Guardian, misrepresented the standard because it said um, that uh, people will be enforced. And of course, that's not the case. Um, this is very much about, you know, individual patient choice. And I think it's, it's true to say that ne negative reactions are typically uh, based on the uncontextualized uh, assumptions about the process and indeed the feasibility of monitoring a patient's sexual orientation. Um, and I'm hoping that the situation has moved on, but there is still um, a, a long way to go, I believe, across the system. Thanks very much, Joe. if you can drop that down now. So I think I'm gonna finish really by talking about why it's really, really important to ensure that we maintain the focus on monitoring. Um, because monitoring um, enables an improved um, understanding of uh, LGBT people's needs. It better enables us to identify health risks at the population level. It does help to ensure equitable access for LGBT patients. And it actually also really, really importantly acknowledges an LGBT patient's um, identity. And that is really, really important because our identities matter, particularly in the arena of um, health and social care settings, because often we are in quite vulnerable uh, situations. And we have got really, really good evidence to back up that actually asking the question in an appropriate and respectful way will um, actually engender really, really good results and will improve patient outcomes as well. Because it's really, really important to kind of like remember that you will definitely get a positive um, reaction to the vast majority of people if you ask us to disclose um, our sexual orientation or our gender identity. Um, we also know that the data that's generated will help to target work and services. We know um, that the significant unaddressed health inequities um, that exist amongst LGBT people compared to the general population. We know that LGBT people are more likely to self-harm um, and commit suicide. We know we are more likely to uh, abuse alcohol and drugs. We know we're more likely to experience eating disorders. We know that LGBT couples can be more likely um, to uh, uh, be in domestically abusive relationships. And we also know that LGBT people can suffer from increased isolation and loneliness. So having the data to sort of like help to identify where those risks are and where those needs are and so that the resources can be uh, allocated appropriately are really, really important. And I think that it's also true to say that the introduction of this information standard um, has led to other really positive um, results. We've seen um, really, really um, amazing data generated by Government Equalities Office back in 2018 from the National LGBT uh, Survey. That wouldn't have happened without the introduction and the work that had already gone on behind the scenes to introduce um, the uh, information standard. We also uh, have seen this year um, a sexual orientation and a gender identity question in the census, which again, we work very closely with the ONS to ensure that we laid the ground and did the groundwork to make sure that uh, happened. So I think that I'm just going to leave you with, with a few kind of like, you know, thoughts about why monitoring um, is really, really important and why monitoring should continue to be near the top of our agenda as LGBT um, activists and allies in the health and social care settings. Um, monitoring helps to create an environment of openness, which will help us to, uh, and the patient, to disclose their personal information in a much more um, respectful way. And monitoring helps to add to the evidence base around need. And that is absolutely vital in um, today's um, sort of like health and social care settings where evidence-based uh, delivery is really, really key. So I would just like to sort of like thank everybody that's been uh, played a part in the journey. There's been many, 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 many people that have worked really, really hard 
over the last 10 or so years to sort of like ensure that sexual orientation and trans status monitoring takes place across public services. And I want to thank all of those people that have played that part, particularly um, the LGBT patients that have given their information and data so freely. Um, the launch of today's uh, report is dedicated to all of you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, great start to the to the session. Um, just just to remind everybody, if you have questions, could you put them in the Q and A box um, rather than the chat box? Uh, that's where we're going to be focusing to pull off the the questions for the discussion. You'll see that the Q and A is the icon to the right hand side at the bottom of the screen in the toolbar there. So please do continue to put your questions in the Q and A as we. Uh, along it's the only way to ask uh questions um i can see a couple of people are, are raising raising hands if you've got questions to to put uh please do just put them in the q a section. okay so um uh, leading on from Paul, I'm just going to spend just a, a few minutes talking a little bit about the context uh, for this report and how it feeds into the work that we're doing uh, at uh, NHS uh, England. Um, myself and my team uh, have been around for two and a bit years and we're charged um, with addressing health inequalities for, that LGBT plus uh, people face across uh, health and uh, social care. And our work really uh, it focuses on supporting, advising and encouraging the system to do better. And data collection and monitoring is probably the single biggest piece of that work. It's not the only thing uh, that we do, but it's probably the single thing that takes the greatest uh, amount of uh, time. And that's why um, this report, this best practice uh, guidance is such a fundamental part of that work. What we know where we do collect data, as Paul has said, uh, that LGBT plus people face um, inequalities in access to care, inequalities in their experience of care and inequalities in their uh, uh, clinical uh, outcomes uh, from care. And I think it's correct to say that um, that is in every single setting. I've not seen any data to show that LGBT plus people fare better than their heterosexual or cisgendered uh, peers. So collecting that data and using it in a meaningful way is really important. We, it's not to say that we don't have data, but it's not collected systematically and robustly across the system. Frequently, the data that we have uh, comes from surveys, often from voluntary and community uh, sector organisations, such as the Stonewall Health Report, Hidden Figures Report from the LGBT Foundation and, and many others, or data comes from uh, specific pieces of research. Where our biggest gaps are, and this is a real challenge in terms of, of affecting not just individual patient care, but also policy across the system is that we don't collect data with, it, uh, with a couple of uh, exceptions in clinical data sets, nor in the data sets that we use, for example, to collect information on our NHS uh, workforce. Um, it's great that we have Michelle from Clinic Q here to talk about their experience because sexual health and HIV is one area where we do collect uh, both sexual orientation, gender identity and trans status routinely. Uh, it is partially being collected uh, in uh, mental health settings, but there are gaps uh, everywhere uh, else. Uh, and still, if you uh, are employed by the NHS uh, and you're trans and non-binary, you're not able to record uh, that in the um, uh, in the data collection in the in the workforce uh, employment um, uh, databases. As as, as Paula said, um, the, I think the context around this has changed from when this work started nearly a decade ago. Sexual orientation and gender identity uh, trans status questions in the census is a massive step forward um, in terms of not just giving us that data, and we all look forward to that with great anticipation, but setting the context uh, for other settings around asking uh, these questions. And you might be aware if you follow us on social media that for us last week was quite a busy data week. Um, we had, um, we're pleased to 
uh, see the publication of, of uh, some uh, research from uh, NATSEN and NHS Digital, um, which for the first time analysed the results of the health survey for England uh, by sexual orientation. Um, but uh, that gave us this really rich data, but highlights one of the continuing problems in the fact that there is no data within that data set so on trans uh, and non-binary people. Uh, and also um, the GP patient experience survey, which is the NHS's largest patient experience survey uh, and the first to include questions on gender identity uh, and trans status and we'll be sharing more details on that and there'll be links and information in that in the in the FA, FAQs and I think what the GP patient experience survey has taught us is that although it takes a huge amount of work to get the questions in the survey the world still keeps turning that doesn't come crashing around our ears. Uh, you know, the, the, the response rates to the GP patient experience survey this year were the highest that they've been for many years. And we'll be analyzing how the questions worked, but everything worked fine. And we've got better da data on primary care experience of, uh, of gender diverse uh, people. Paul's already uh, really highlighted um, why collecting this information is, is, is important. You know, I think it's also important for those of us who work for organisations within the healthcare setting to remind ourselves that we have a statutory responsibility under the Health and Social Care Act, under the Equality Act and under our public sector equality duty to eliminate discrimination and to advance uh, the, the experience of uh, minority or disadvantaged groups. And you cannot do that unless you know how many uh, people uh, from a minority sexual orientation or who are gender diverse are using your services and also as Paul said it gives us a really good understanding or would give us a really good understanding of the breadth and depth of inequalities it gives us a benchmark against which to um, to measure future um, uh, changes or the the, the 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 things that we do to improve uh, experience or or outcome and as Paul said it is a really powerful way of services demonstrating that they are includes inclusive of LGBT plus people that they are seen and that they are welcomed and that their needs uh, will be met I'm hoping that we'll get chance during the Q&A to talk about this a little bit more but there is some great data that comes from the LGBT foundations pride in practice uh, pro program and their uh, pride primary care survey, which shows the patient experience is better or people feel their needs are best better met by their GPs in those settings where primary care is asking the questions about sexual orientation uh, and gender identity. It's not simple, as Paul said, this work has been going on for many, many years, and we recognise that there are probably two components, both of which are addressed within this, um, if, uh, if we're not counted, we don't count, report two components to making change, one of which is about structural things, making sure that the IT systems, the data sets, the flow that sits behind um, us asking the questions is right, but also, and perhaps more importantly, again, as Paul has highlighted, the importance of the hearts and minds, making sure that NHS staff understand the reasons why they need to ask the questions, the importance of questions, of, using the, of, of asking these questions, and the importance of using that data in a meaningful way, and also giving people from the LGBT plus community who frequently don't have confidence and trust in NHS services, um, giving them the confidence to share their data, to explain why it's going to be used, who it's going to be shared with, um, uh, what the impact of giving this information will be uh, and how that information will be protected. So those are two areas that we're continuing to work on uh, nationally. This report is a really fundamental, I would say, piece of our ongoing work. It's not the only thing that we're doing, but is really, uh, you know, refreshing this data and having a really um, practical, useful, supportive best practice guide um, is key uh, to uh, the wider work uh, that we're doing. And it's great that you've come to hear about it this morning. And I would encourage you to read the report. It's got great practical information on how to ask the questions, on why it's important, on how to use and analyze the data, as well as some great case studies from both primary care, secondary care, the community, dental services and uh, regulators like uh, the GMC. So just to finish off a few um, sort of things for me about what next, where next, um, as I say, this document will be a live document and will form part of future work. Paul has um, really highlighted the challenges of when um, the sexual orientation information standard was launched and we hear that and recognize that and we are pulling together a consortium or a collaboration 
of senior or, or, or influencing organizations across the system to support this work and that will include regulators, royal colleges, senior leaders across uh, the NHS to really make the statement about why this is important which will hopefully filter down uh, to local systems. We are constantly working uh, with um, local organizations, uh, NHS trusts, primary care, um, increasingly with integrated uh, care, care systems. Um, our Rainbow Badge project has data collection as a fundamental uh, part of achieving uh, a benchmark standard award for NHS trusts. Um, and as I said, we recognize that we're a small team um, and we can't do this alone, so we will have to do this in partnership. So I'll finish by just again adding my thanks to the community, the individuals from the LGBT plus community and the organisations who have been driving this agenda for, as we've heard, nearly a decade and probably longer than that. Their tireless efforts have got us to the stage where we're at now and make, it must be said, my life uh, much easier. So on that, I will finish and we're going to hand over to our next speaker. So it is a real pleasure to meet and welcome uh, Patrick, um, who is the co-founder of uh, Bring Dementia Out and is going to speak to us a little bit more from a personal uh, perspective around the importance of collecting this data. Thanks, Patrick. Hey, good morning. How did everyone know I'm still a bit nervous? But anyway, um, I'm Patrick Atenez. I am the co-founder of Bring Dementia Out. I was diagnosed as the youngest person in the UK with frontal lobe atrophy, so it's a form of early onset. Um, I've done a lot of campaigning to develop an organization that helps train individuals nowadays on LGBT needs around dementia. Um, the person, I mean, there's a few things, there's three things I'd like to just quickly mention. Paul mentioned something about um, it's important around evidence based and needs, and that's important because in my training, I tell a story which I'll tell you all quickly. Um, there was a trans woman who went into a care home here in the UK, and um, she was retransitioned as a male by her family, and the care home went along with it. Um, and it was horrific, um, only for the simple fact that, you know, we don't sort out our next of kin, et cetera. The reason why is this is related towards this is because if we did a lot of monitoring, these situations would not take place. The second part I like to mention is sexual monitor. I mean, sexual health monitoring is important because we're normalizing it. I mean, back in the day, I, I'm 38 years old, back home in Barbados, when we used to do any sort of monitoring, it was, are you black, are you white? Are you, <clears throat> Are you spiritual? No, are you, are you Christian or are you not? And over times, over a period of time, everything started increasing more and more. You'd be able to identify more nowadays when you see a form. And it also normalizes our existence. If a trans person goes into a care home or in any establishment, those practices can see through that data how many people from our community, especially non-binary, gay, lesbian, doesn't make a difference. Once there's a box for them to tick, these services can then ask for assistance services like myself from my organization or from the LGBT foundation, they can ask for that because through the monitoring aspect, they will be able to see how many people flow into these organizations and ask for the assistance. I live here in the UK by myself. There was a period of time I didn't have any family around me or friends. I had to do a lot on my own. Um, and the reason why it's important for the monitoring aspect is because people cannot believe I live by myself. They couldn't believe that I had no family or support around me or friends to come to appointments with me, especially when they asked me, why did you get your parents to call in? I'm like, well, my parents live 5,000 miles away. There no one's here for that. And they just kept on repeating it. If organizations understood that LGBT people do not have the same heterosexual norm environments of family base, they would be able to understand a lot of us are on our own and by ourselves. And it's a scary thought. I still don't have any family here in the UK, but I have a little bit more support now. My support is the foundation and Alzheimer's society, but they've taken upon themselves to understand the existence of us. We exist. And if we go into GP practices, we just want to be seen and heard and understood and treated accordingly. People's perceptive and understanding towards us would diminish or there's slight insecurities around us because everyone's a little bit insecure when they have to meet someone new or explain the situation or the sexual orientation. And over a period of time, that would diminish. And that's really basically the only thing I really had to mention today to everybody from a personal, from a person-centered point of view. But if there's any questions, by all means ask me. 
Thank you very much, Patrick. Yep, so again, if you have any questions, we're encouraging you to put those in the Q&A uh, box. And if you want your question to go to one, as one of the specific uh, to, uh, panelists, then if you can put that in uh, the question, that would be helpful uh, as well. But we'll all be here to answer the questions shortly. Um, okay, moving on. Um, uh, it is a great pleasure now to introduce uh, Michelle Ross, who is founder of Clinic Q and is going to talk to us and I think share some slides on monitoring and uh, why it matters from, from her perspective. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Michael. I'm, as um, Michael said, I'm Michelle Ross. I'm the founder of Clinic Q and the director and psychotherapist. And I've been a psychotherapist for 33 years and I say that most times I present because that feels really important as a trans person. We are professionals as well as serve people who receive services as well. So often trans people are seen as people who just receive services as if we're not professionals. And it's really important to acknowledge we're professionals in all aspects of not only health, but many areas. And thank you, Patrick. Um, some of what you said really touches on some of the things I'm going to talk about within the slides. Let me just bring up the slides if I can. If not, I know Joe's got them. Let me just, um, all right. Okay. A minute. Great. Where are they? They seem to have disappeared. Joe, can you, oh, there they are. Okay, great. Great. Let me just slip to the front one. Perfect. Um, I think that's on full view, is it? No. Is it? No, it's not. Um, great. So, um, why does data matter? Clinic Q is a community interest company, and we've been delivering services for 10 years, well, almost 10 years. And from the very start, as trans people, who um, is a trans organization, we knew that data had to be at the foundations of what we do. And in fact, when I talk about data, I mean data on trans and non-binary people. And um, it was really important in terms of not only about collecting data, but also people seeing their self on forms and people who also were delivering services who might not be trans. It also informs people that trans people matter. I'll just bring that along to the next slide. And I say here, not hard to count when you know how to count us. And this resource that we're talking about today really does make it much easier. It really informs a whole lot of um, how to do it. And it shows you examples of how people use this and what can come out of that. So it um, validates trans and non-binary people's well-being and health. And um, so I'm going to focus on um, trans and non-binary people here today and it informs staff and uh, that trans and non-binary people's health matters. And not only about the forms, it informs all your practices. So the forms are there, they inform your practices and it reinforces that. You know, not everyone's had training, but it shows that these, it's inclusive, that your, your practice matters and that it, as I said earlier, it validates trans people's access to health. Consent is vital in all that we do at Clinic Q. And we know that when, I, when people have the Gender Recognition Certificate and the Gender Recognition Act, there's certain laws around disclosing that and sharing that data. So we, we ask people consent, people can say, sign a consent form saying that we're going to need to share this with some of our team um, who might not, um, each time you come, might not have seen you before. And it's really important that people know uh, your history of accessing the services and health um, situation. So it's really important because it's not okay just to share that information about trans people without um, that consent and that informed consent. Also, um, we treat everybody as if they have a gender recognition certificate because we can't ask whether they have one or not. And we wouldn't ask that. And it helps trans people count in all aspects of health. And um, 
when I say that, I'm going to show you an example that Michael touched on earlier about how um, the HARS HIV and AIDS reporting system really shows how and demonstrates how that works. And it also brings up, well, there's a, a real lack of evidence in all health inequalities. You know, we have various research done, but internationally, uh, there's no evidence of all the inequalities. And yet Michael, um, Paul and, and Patrick have mentioned very clearly how there's, um, there is real a lack of that evidence. And this resource really helps to uh, bring about a change in that area. And we all have intersections, all of us, whether we're older, whether we're younger, whether, you know, um, but black trans people and people of color increase risk of poor mental health and higher physical, uh, poorer physical health and social, higher social deprivation. And that's a generalization, not all people have experienced that, but it's really important in terms of, you know, when people are accessing um, health services, there can be huge barriers in place before you, systemic barriers, before people even get through the door. And a lot of people, LGBT and trans people, often avoid accessing health services because of those barriers and because of how they are met in, when they're accessing services. And Patrick touched on, well, you didn't touch on older trans people, but you mentioned someone was go, went detransitioned or was transitioned by their, uh, detransitioned by their family. And there is a real concern of many older trans people. And I know as an older trans person myself, and I've spoken to lots of uh, older trans people, the real fear of accessing the healthcare as you get older. So going into a care home and how that they are met there, how they are treated if they are found to be trans. And that is, that really saddens me. And yet I know it's a fact. And I know that people are really scared of that. And people have said to me, well, I'd sooner commit suicide than go into a care home because of the situation as it is now. And um, I hope that this document, this um, resource really does bring about those systemic changes. I don't expect it overnight, but I expect it and hope that it brings about change. And I'm gonna show you um, the HARS example, HIV and AIDS reporting system of how the whole system didn't fall apart. The NHS didn't fall apart. Public Health England didn't fall apart because we started collecting this. And we can only show this data from 2015. That's when we started collecting this inclusive data set. And um, until 2015, the UK had no data on trans people living with HIV, accessing HIV services. So we worked with um, Public Health Clinic, we worked with Public Health England to change this. And um, as you can see, it's not just about um, chasing numbers. It's about showing the health issues, the stigma, the access to services that uh, people might face uh, when they do access services. So uh, I'll just read this off. It shows the percentage of trans male and gender diverse people and 88% um, of the people accessing HIV services were trans female. Most of them, or just over half, lived in the London area and most lived in, in cities, really. Um, and there was a range of ages, as you can see there, from aged over 50 to the middle age and um, 15 to 34. So it affected many range, age ranges. And BAME, BAME, Black and People of Colour, were 38% and 62%. So that's what inclusive data does. When you start collecting data that demonstrates people, um, especially in trans people, what happens when people access a health service, but also positive voices. They also did a survey on trans people living with HIV. And it showed you there the, the disparities in healthcare for a trans person living with HIV and other people and the stigma that people faced. So how do we collect this? Well, we use this. 
um, and it was a two-state data collection. And Kuni Q had been using this data set for 10 years. And actually we changed it slightly. Some of the wording changed over the years, but this is what we did. And it's so simple. It just astounds me that people can't see how simple that is. And this isn't mandatory. If somebody comes along to our service and they might have a trans history, they might not want to say that they're trans woman or trans man. So they can just take this, which says a woman or a man. And then is this the same gender you are assigned at birth? So they can say yes or no. It is that I'll prefer not to say. It really is important that people either trust the system and don't have to feel that they have to disclose. But you know, where people can, we do encourage that. Not that we say we encourage you to do it, but it's there as an option and it's really important because of why this matters. So why does it matter? Well, one day, and I know Michael's seen this before, but one day I was sitting in what we call the community space, the waiting area for clinic use services. On, um, and, um, and this uh, trans guy who's in his 40s said this to me, going to other services, I always have to explain about my body, explain again and again I am trans and I'm tired of it. Coming to Clinic Q and places similar to Clinic Q, I know I don't have to explain, I just tell them what's happening. And that I remember to this day, and this was about seven years ago, and that was vital. It showed a, a, a confidence that they were going to be treated in the way that they see themselves and people are seen in this. Well, that's about it, I think. Okay. Uh, yes, I've got to stop sharing. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, so we come to the Q&A um, section of the session. Now, it's great to see so many questions. I think we've got about 50 now, so we're not going to be able to get through all of them. So apologies uh, for that. But as I said, we will take the questions and answer them and then circulate them uh, later on. So um, let's just start. I'm just going to uh, pick out uh, a few and try and get a, a range of topics. So uh, a question here about question, asking the question about asexuality. Uh, this important monitoring is long overdue. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm disappointed that asexuality as a sexual orientation was not included uh, and I feel this is a missed opportunity. Uh, can you offer an explanation, explanation as why? Um, Paul, having gone through those discussions at the beginning of the preparation for, or, the, or the publication of the sexual orientation monitoring, are you able to, to shed any light on that? And I can also then say some things about what we're doing going forward. Yeah, and I'm also happy to pick up the question about GDPR as well, Michael, if you want me to, because I actually just quickly check and I've got the um, uh, exact uh, section of the act that will be uh, helpful. But yeah, um, uh, I saw the question earlier on from Dominic. Hi, Dominic. Sorry that I can't see you, um, but obviously you can see me. It's lovely to know that you're on the call. Hi. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it, there, there are lots of missed opportunities, but as Michelle has just so eloquently said, you know, uh, Clinic Q and indeed many of our services have been sort of like having the trans status monitoring questions simply inserted from the beginning and the world hasn't stopped turning. Um, the system, the health and social care system, is slightly different. Uh, we weren't even able to persuade the system back in uh, 2017 to include um, uh, trans status or, or sort of like broaden the gender identity. So any other sort of like sexual identities had absolutely no chance of being included. And for that, I am forever sorry, um, because I think we are missing really, really important um, sort of like approaches. There was meant to be some research that was being done across government, uh, led by Government Equality Office, um, around non-binary identities and their sexuality. I'm not entirely sure where that, that data is up. There is meant to be a cross-government harmonisation project on monitoring, um, particularly looking at including sexual orientation and trans status monitoring. But as you are probably more than well aware, the current politics uh, across government around sort of like, you know, LGBT inclusion and equality are still uh, uh, going through some quite difficult challenges. So I think that we have to be patient. I know that's not a great answer. I don't like that answer either. Um, we just need to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, and I think Michael and his team, whilst 
whilst they're not necessarily going to be able to change things overnight, I think that these types of priorities are on their list. And I think that they will work them through uh, as, as best they possibly can. So not a great answer from our perspective, but it is just kind of like where things are up to. In terms of the GD, sorry. sorry just, 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 just coming on that, and then I'll just let everybody know what the GDPR question is. Just, just to say that we, we, we have this on our list of things to do to update the uh, sexual orientation uh, monitoring uh, information standard to include asexual and pansexual. Um, so we, it's on our radar and we, we're, we're working on that. And I will draw your attention to, there's a little bit of detail, which I won't go through now in the interest of time, in the guide about how asexual is collected or coded. And as, pa and as Paula said, and, and Michelle has demonstrated, you know, as services, you know, we can still ask extra, extra questions. And, and if somebody's, if there isn't a box for somebody to tick then that can still be recorded in their in their record or, or, or asked outside of the data set so we'll just move on so thanks for taking the gdpr question so just so, so everyone knows uh, the question is my company says gdpr is the main blocker for self-identification of gender or sexuality at work is this true what are the work what are the workarounds to avoid a data privacy regulation issue yeah, it's not true. I think as we, we as I mentioned at the beginning, and as Michelle has said, and as you said, Michael, there are lots of people that try and throw up obstacles to get in the way. GDPR is not one of them. Article 9, uh, Section 2, Subsection H, specifically covers the collecting, recording and monitoring of patient data. Um, and so therefore GDPR should not um, apply in this circum well, in these circumstances. Thank you. Very, very precise. There are there are there are a few questions on the same theme around, around protecting data. So it's good to have that clarification. And um, the the other barrier that we often get, uh, and Michelle has addressed uh, this partly, is concerned around uh, Section Twenty Two of the Gender Recognition Recognition Act, um, which uh, should not be a barrier to collecting this information at all, uh, at all. And we'll be able to address that in a bit more detail in the in the FAQs. Okay, I wanted to move on to a question question and come probably to all of you, perhaps Patrick first, because I think it speaks to the sometimes the challenges um, around um, the confidence that people from LGBT plus communities have giving their information. We see across the board in many surveys that often um, uh, one of the commonest choices is prefer not to say. Um, so the question is, do you have any examples of successful campaigns or communications or guest approaches that have helped explain to patients why we want them to share the data and why this demographic information is so uh, useful to us? So how can we support people feel more comfortable to, to give their info? I'm going to come to you first, Patrick, and then Michelle. Um, okay, so I have an amazing relationship with my GP. I have been with him for about 10 years. Let me know if I go off topic, but um, it's, it's my brain. Um, he's taken the time to understand myself and he's taken the time to research anything. I think it's important for GPs. I mean, they, they never stop studying. They're supposed to continue and change. And with a lot of the services that I've had to receive, I mean, the one thing he said to me is like, you made me really work for my degree. Yeah? And as much of it as a joke, it's, it's the truth. And he took the time, he accessed services. He went out to reach out um, to people to, to find out if I needed extra help and support because I was a complicated case with my condition. And these are the sort of things that I feel that are important for GPs to do because I mean, I, I'll never change my GP. I mean, he, He's been amazing, he's saved my life, but that's only because not under asking me whether I was gay or, or bi or trans, it's because he took the time. Empathy is something that's massively important. And I think this is something that we forget that in any services is the empathic understanding of an individual and their need and their requirements. I identified as trans when I was younger. I came to England to have a sex change, but I never went ahead with it. So I have a lot of care and empathy for the trans community, but I see their fears in my own training. You know, um, Michelle, I have up, up, up amount of respect for you. Um, when you talked about as well, people um, who decided just to commit suicide if they didn't receive the care. I'm part of the ethics group for Alzheimer's Europe. And it was only just mentioned that someone um, was just diagnosed with dementia. They, they never had transition. So they put on their makeup, they shave every day, et cetera. And she went to the care homes in Europe and I asked if they would be able to do her makeup, et cetera. And they said, no, they didn't have the time. 
Now in Europe, it is legal to have euthanasia. The first thing she did that day after calling an enormous round of care homes was sign up for euthanasia because she rather just end it on her own terms and it's called dying with dignity, then, then go ahead with this. And this is something that, you know, it's, it's starting here with us, which is amazing, but just to have that box there means that we exist. And that is it. We just want to be seen and everyone's stigma goes <laughs> when you're, when you see it there. It means that if my GP had to face myself and I said to him, look, I, I want to transition, he would reach out to the LGBT Foundation or reach out to correct services and go, I have a patient who, who wants to transition. I, I'm not equipped with it. What can I do to better um, educate myself? And this is it. It makes services like the LGBT Foundation, services like mine, accessible to us because we're here to help everybody. We cannot do all alone, but we need your assistance, but we need to be visible and seen and have the empathy just to ask us the question. Hopefully that's answered your question. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Michelle, any, any thoughts from you on how we can encourage people to feel confident to answer the question? Hmm. Well, I'll say this first, um, just to touch on Patrick um, about GPs. I have a great GP, uh, a whole set of them, uh, not just for me alone, their practice, but also um, I've been with them 30 years, so I've raised their awareness, I've helped that, but not all trans people might feel confident or able to do that because often the power sits with the GP and not necessarily with the patient or so it's felt. And, um, you know, I think, um, how would I encourage people to do that? I think it's really difficult, Michael, um, to say that people should have the courage or the, the strength or able to do that because I think people are feeling vulnerable, especially more so than ever in, um, with all the attacks on trans people and the, and the uh, I'm going to call it a kickback of rights around trans people. So I think there's a, I know there's a lot of uh, people feeling extremely vulnerable at present. And I just read in the Q&A box here about a trans person, uh, someone that reports that um, MX flashes up on the, the, the um, thing and um, and then people, that person gets a load of looks because people don't always know what MX means, MX, you know. Or, um, and that really shouldn't be there. It should not be present because in a way, that's a, a public disclosure of someone's identity or questions about it that people don't need to know. Just their people's names should flash up at a GP's or any services, really. And also making sure that many trans people who have changed their gender expression to match how they feel, the system might not have been changed. And that when they're present in a waiting area and they get another name, which they can identify means them or part of their history, doesn't mean to say that that, and it's disclosure, it's inappropriate. It can create harm when someone leaves that, they might be vulnerable to attack. I don't know if I'm answering your question, Michael, but these are what's present for me at the moment. Thank you. Now we're running very short of time and there's a couple of topics that I want us to try and address in here. And as I said, we will uh, try and answer all of your questions in an FAQ. So um, the next one I want us to go to um, is, uh, and I uh, may come to Paul and, and Michelle for this, um, it's about engagement and co-production. Do you have do you or have you involved trans and non-binary people in the design of questions and data collection? If yes, how do you how do you do this? Um, so yeah, how do we ensure that we 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 um, communicate and engage with the communities that we're that we're working with? Um, I might come to Paul first and then to Michelle. Yeah, sure. We we do the very best we can in terms of co-design and co-production at LGBT Foundation. So we involve members of the community at every single stage. Um, and we try and do that in a very, very authentic and really transparent way. We also recruit members of the community as community organisers. Um, and uh, we sort of like, you know, try and wherever possible, um, not only involve and engage, but actually sort of like, you know, encourage members of the community to lead us and, and sort of like teach us. I also think, you know, we're all members or most of us are members of the LGBTQ plus communities as well. So I think often our own experiences uh, are brought to bear um, with um, the 
um, uh, work that we do. But I, I suppose that the, the, the key point that I would want to kind of like, you know, make is the outcome of our work is not necessarily what we would do if we were allowed to kind of like, you know, design the systems uh, ourselves. We, we're we working within quite restrictive, quite difficult, quite challenging uh, uh, environments where people often change very, very quickly. Uh, and as you know, Michael and uh, Michelle, quite often it's relatively junior members of teams that are given LGBT health inequalities to deal with. And they're often the ones that are kind of like rotated out very, very quickly. So I've worked with a whole raft of different people uh, over the last 10 years um, in this space. And you can like get people to a certain point and then you kind of like, you know, uh, uh, then have to start again because you've got somebody new coming in. So I think that we need to kind of recognize that LGBT uh, Q plus health inequalities are still relatively low down the pecking order. So the fact that we're doing anything is really, really positive. Um, and there's some really, really brilliant examples in the book and also sort of like that I'm sure will be put in the question and answers uh, that will really inspire you and enable you to kind of like learn about best practice. Thanks, uh, Paul. Do you have anything to add to that, Michelle? Around I do, I do. And i just say that, you see, what you did there, Paul, was demonstrate good practice. And I think what is good practice is involving the people that are, like, say, for, I'm going to talk again about the trans community. So um, before we started CUNYQ, I started it, I looked internationally for examples of good practice, really. And there was one uh, organisation in San Francisco had been around quite a few years. They didn't deliver services, but they did a lot of research on trans health. And they had um, the two stage data collection, but it was somehow that parts of it didn't seem to fit with the UK. So we took that, adapted it, put it to a small group of trans and non-binary people and to see what they say. So we adapted that and cut it down a bit. And then we put it wider, we took it to community groups and um, and then that's slightly changed again, but mostly there was a positive response. There were some concerns that would I have to, like I said earlier, would I have to disclose that I'm trans? You know, this doesn't feel right. I'm just a person. Why do I have to disclose that? So we took that into account. So, you know, it's about an option and why the option is there and how important it is. All the things that we've discussed here. Um, so yeah, that's what we did. And it's about good practice really. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Now, I love talking about data collection and monitoring and could keep going all day, but we have unfortunately come to the end of our time. We've got a lot of work to take away because there's loads of really great questions in the, in the Q&A. So apologies if we haven't got to yours, but we will uh, endeavour to uh, address them and then circulate them um, after the meeting. Uh, Joe, could you just put up the, the final slide before we, before, we all, before we all go, just to remind uh, you all that uh, the uh, the work, the guide that we've been talking about is available on the LGBT Foundation website uh, and the link is there lgbt.foundation forward slash monitoring. Um, if you have any questions about uh, monitoring, uh, please do contact us, uh, the LGBT health team at NHS uh, England. Uh, that's our email address. Um, I, I'm almost certain that if you have a question, if you're facing a challenge or a difficulty, we will have come across it thought about it or, and hopefully have a plan to address it. We're also really keen to hear, uh, which is why having uh, examples in the in the good practice uh, guide, it was really uh, important. So it was really clear to hear where you've had successes as well. So if you've managed to do something in this area and overcome some barriers uh, in whatever uh, aspect it might be, please do let us know because we're really keen to share that information across the system. So um, uh, on that, I'm gonna close uh, today's uh, webinar with final thanks for all of our speakers uh, for all of those who are behind the scenes who've been supporting us with the tech, for everybody who's contributed to uh, this work in general over the last uh, decade or so, and specifically for the work that you've done on uh, this uh, guide. If we're not counted, we don't uh, count. So thanks everybody. Um, keep in touch and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>